Good morning. It is so good to see you here. Forgive my distractedness this morning. Um, I don't know what's more exciting, actually seeing you here or being able to hide behind this pulpit, uh, but it exciting. it's exciting to me. Um, we, uh, right up front, thank you for your patience and uh, for your flexibility. Uh, these ropes are made so that we can tweak them, move them if we need to. Uh, the rules are we're to stay apart by six feet as family units. Um, you can do a little more of that left to right in a zigzag than you can just by those uh, roped pews. They actually prescribe that we're to rope off every other. Uh, we've done that for the most part. Having said that, the Greater Dochimo clan has treated themselves like, an ex like one family unit. So we're just quarantining from them. They can all be together, and that's how we're treating it downstairs. Um, you know, that way, that, that actually helps quite a bit, just to give them a few rows together, that sort of thing. Uh, so we're trying to uh, do this. Uh, the law that's out there says that if you can social distance, you don't have to wear a mask. So as far as singing goes and so forth, it's actually specified that I don't have to wear one since I'm far enough away. I, Judy and I have a good 16 feet. Uh, Kareth and I have 12 or 14. We're in great shape. Um, but uh, anyway, there's all that. There are masks in the back. If you don't have them, the ushers would offer them to you as you came in. Um, we're doing our best uh, to handle that, to let some combination of my wife, daughter, and moms take care of kids and try our best to keep them apart by family units so that we can actually have church together. Um, it's still, the, the, unfortunately, the virus is still alive and well. If you didn't see the um, email, Jacob Abraham, that would be Margaret Wood's grandson, uh, has it. He's in the hospital with it, with that, and inflamed pancreas, and he's got gallstones, and they can't take care of his internal issues until they can get ahead of the COVID, so uh, be praying for that. Uh, but uh, it's around. We've got to treat it seriously, and uh, we need it. It's the very first time, I, I tell you, I had to let go of this pulpit the first time I preached in here without people because I typically have my hand on it and I was shaking so bad the microphone was distracting me. So uh, I had to let go. But uh, anyway, uh, going through all of this, uh, it is a delight to be back together. Uh, our first sermon, my first sermon in here without you was let every soul be subject to the higher powers, the powers that be ordained of God. Uh, that's a whole discussion. You, you want to talk, have some fun, talk to Jason about that and ask him who the powers that be are. Uh, there's a great debate here uh, in our town between the Board of Health and the Select Board. Uh, the Board of Health feels much entitled to the uh, powers that be ultimate title, uh, and it's not on paper that way. So anyway, uh, but the fact of the matter is we're doing our best. I printed out all, 18 pa or all 13 pages, eight and five, to two different things about what we're to do and not do and uh, we're giving it our level best and we're going to celebrate and praise the lord together and lift up his word together and we're delighted to do it at one as one please be patient uh as you see we can't pla uh, pass a plate um the mailbox the christmas time mailbox has made a wonderful offering receptacle um i commend you and i delight in the lord our financial situation is better than pre-quarantine god's people have been very faithful in their giving I commend you and thank you. It's been fantastic to see. It's a delight. Um, so please avail yourself on the way in or the way out of the uh, mailbox. Uh, you can be even more private with your giving than usual. It's kind of nice that way. Uh, we had to take <coughs> hymnals and uh, Bibles out. So we're doing things on the wall. And if you haven't figured it out already, that's not our norm. So we're, we're doing it on the fly. Um, if you'd like to help me with this a little bit, Kareth did up slides for me, which was awesome. She can't, she, she can't click through them while she plays for them. And uh, I'm going to try to click through them while I lead them, and uh, we'll see how it all goes. Uh, our call to worship this morning is really the, the high point of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Would you turn with me to number 208? Well, actually, you're not turning, are you? There's habits. I turn to number 282. Jesus is coming again. Marvelous message we bring. Glorious carol we sing. Wonderful word of the King. Jesus is coming again. 
This is something I haven't tried this way before, but since you can't follow in your pew Bible, and I know quite a few of you are in the habit of not packing your sword, uh, you ought to pack your sword to church. If you don't want to carry a book, put it on your phone. You won't offend me. I've had people ask me, Pastor, do you mind if I read the Bible on my iPad in church? I said, no, I know you've been doing it for months. Keep doing it. What do you mean you know? Well, your face shines blue when you do it. It's kind of fun from up here. Uh, but uh, I'll be honest, most of my Bible reading is on electronic devices. Now I can scale the, scale the font to suit myself, so uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but uh, if you join me here and just uh, follow as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 in its entirety. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. All the way my Savior leads me.
All right, we're good. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. I'm going to change our order just a touch. Um, I'm going to do announcements and then have special music. That's all right. Okay. By way of announcements, that second page of the bulletin has been, uh, it's funny, we haven't used the sound system in here. We've got all the bugs outside worked out and it's still fighting with us here now. Um, we are being brave. Uh, we had our work day yesterday. Thank you to everybody who came. We had a terrific crew here, inside and outside. Uh, fence on the back side, a, a mostly permanent fence on the back side of the grassy play area and the back is up. Uh, Adam's gonna take care of putting the temporary fence back up on the front and as it faces the building uh, before Tuesday morning uh, so that it'd be easier to corral our kids and uh, let the ladies have ladies Bible study. They started on Tuesday morning. Uh, last week with that worked out really well. Judy, if you really wanna sit in your car, we, we proved it yesterday, this lapel mic works out there. And so Kim's happy to wear it and, and I can tell her how to set up in here so that it can come to your car. So just you let us know or anybody else that's willing to actually come and uh, sit in their car but not comfortable under the pavilion, please let us know and we'll accommodate that any way that we can. And by the way, if anybody's in the pl uh, parking lot today, hi, we're glad you're here. I'm sorry I can't see you, but uh, I'm glad you're not at home and glad you're being with us as much as you uh, dare to be at this time. <laughs> Gotta love it, just gotta love it. Uh, this evening, uh, we are gonna have communion downstairs. Uh, it's gonna be a little different. It's gonna be different because it's downstairs and not up here. Uh, it's gonna be different in that the deacons are not gonna pass out the elements. The elements are going to be on a, a table behind us or beside us. Uh, we have wonderful flexibility, more than we have up here to move our chairs and be socially distant. Uh, but when it's time, you're gonna have to go up and you'll get, your, get the, both of the elements at the same time uh, we actually have had on order for almost a month a pre-wrapped, individually wrapped communion set from CBD, Christian Book Distributors. Uh, we ordered ours a month ago and it has not come in. It still says it's on back order. Uh, the East Hampton Church ordered theirs two days ago and they got them on Saturday. I think that's not fair. But uh, anyway, it, it would, it's kind of amazing. I'm not in love with the idea, but it's better than not having communion. 
uh, but uh, it's actually a little bit like a creamer and you tear it off and there's a wafer and you tear it off and there's uh, your juice and so it's the most sanitary way we could have done it. Uh, we are doing everything we can to keep things sanitary and where that mostly applies is that we're going to have to get up and get the elements ourselves before we partake together but it's, it's to us worth it. It's been far too long since we've remembered the Lord around, the, around his table and uh, so be welcome to come and join us tonight for communion downstairs. We will still be putting everything that we can onto YouTube. Uh, we have purchased a CCLI license and a streaming license this week so we can start now that we're back in here putting music online. Uh, some of it anyway. If you're doing special music and you don't want to be online, you need to let us know and uh, we'll take care of that. We'll, we'll accommodate in that regard. Like I said, ladies, Bible study will be on the radio. If that works, uh, we will keep our services in here on the radio. Uh, it's absolutely nothing but clicking a switch uh, or plugging something in, so we're glad to be able to do that. Uh, we are going to have prayer meeting. Uh, praise the Lord for Zoom. Uh, we've gone from having eight or ten people on a good Wednesday night or Thursday night downstairs. It's only been ten years since it's been Thursday night, and I'm still not saying it. Uh, but uh, we've been having twice that easily. We've been in the high teens, and we've gotten as high as 21 folks together. We're going to keep it on Zoom even while we come back downstairs together. I'll have my computer with me. You can see my ugly mug. If we mute the other computer, you can see from another computer, tablet, or phone. Uh, you can see who else is there. And um, we've had a couple people that just aren't able to come and join us who want us to do that. We're glad to do that. And uh, so one way or the other, you join us for prayer meeting. We'd be very, very glad to have you. Uh, ladies Bible study, the books came in. And if you need a book, see Kim. And uh, we are, again, very glad to be here. We're not taking an offering this morning, so I don't know what to do next. Uh, but Kareth is going to come, and she's going to minister in song.
Uh, we wrapped up last week in the book of Romans, or two weeks ago in the book of Romans. Last week we were somewhat topical. We talked a lot about the sovereignty of God in our current situation. Uh, I have tried and tried to encourage each of you, and I want you to know that before I can encourage you in a certain area and admonish you in a certain area, I have to encourage and admonish myself in that area. Um, I can be a little pessimistic by nature. I can be a little cynical by nature. I have to watch myself that way. Uh, it's easy for us in a situation like we've been in the last few months to see nothing but the negative of it. Uh, I can tell which ones of you sit in front of your TV or your computer all the time. Uh, I can tell by your blood pressure, uh, just by looking at you and talking to you. It's pretty easy to tell who's got too much time in front of the news uh, because it'll just, it'll have an effect. It just does. Uh, we're in unprecedented times. Many people, especially early in this, pastor, is this the beginning of the end times? Is this the beginning of the end times? Is the tribulation around the corner? Well, I can tell you some things with authority. This is not the tribulation. You and I won't be here for that. We're going to be gone in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and this book tells us all about it, First Thessalonians. Uh, so that's one thing we can be sure of. There are signs of the times. There, there are things that the Lord says that we will see, we his followers will see, and he says these are the beginning of the birth pangs. Um, obviously, I've never had a baby. I've been around for the birth of three of them. There was some worry I was going to miss the, the, the birth of the, third, of the first one because and, uh, my friend Bob and his son Kyle are here. Uh, we were friends from North Conway years ago, uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> Uh, and um, our friend Scott Van Dyne, who's preached here for me. Uh, I was working for Scott. Scott was in the mountains on the other side of uh, New Hampshire. He was the only one among us who had a cell phone yet, and he didn't have signal where he was. Pastor Kenny and I were in the mountains on, on the western Maine, and had no, I, I had no idea Kim had been in labor since 10 that morning until I got home at 5 o'clock, and there was a note on the door that said, I, Kim's in, lab, in the hospital in labor, get there now. And I had no idea. I set a land speed record up there. And I got there, and they're like, oh, good, he's here. You can have that baby, Mrs. Heyman. And that was at like 5.15, and Riley didn't come till like 2 in the morning. But anyway, uh, there was a time we were worried. I wasn't there with her when the birth pang started with Riley. They started right after I went to work. And by 10 o'clock, she had gone into the hospital because she'd figured it out. But she had to figure out, and you ladies know all about it. Maybe it was obvious for you, or maybe the first little ones weren't so. But you had to figure out, hey, this is birth pangs. This isn't Braxton Hicks. This isn't, you know, indigestion. This baby's coming. The Lord tells us that we're going to see signs of the times and that they are the beginning. They are those first, and in that way, I think they're probably a little bit alike, those birth pangs, those contractions. Maybe they're not obvious at the very first. I think that what we've seen, I, I, I like the phrase proof of concept. Yesterday, I put this lapel mic on, and I said to Steve, I have my cell phone, I'll call you. And I marched all the way to the far corner of the pavilion so that Steve in here could tell me if this mic picks up from the far corner of the pavilion so we know if we can put it on the radio for Judy on Tuesday. And so we had proof of concept. We proved something could be done because we did it in a, in a small way. The fact that as Americans, we are all of a sudden a bunch of sheep doing what we're told and, and jumping through hoops and saying yes sir, no sir, how high sir, is proof of concept. The fact that the whole world is affected by, by one virus is a proof of concept. Uh, to whom? Uh, maybe to Satan. Uh, last week we talked about you know the man behind the curtain. Is there a man behind the curtain? A George Soros, a Bill Gates who's uh, pushing buttons and pulling levers and, and puppeteering a whole lot of this. And you do a little reading, you tell me what you think. I'll tell you this, there may not be a human behind the curtain, but there is absolutely Satan behind the curtain. And he is his own sort of maestro. The Lord has given it to him, allowed him to be the prince of the power of the air, the God of this present age, the God of this world. And he has had six or 8,000 years to really hone his craft, and he's very stinking good at it. And so he's using this everywhere he can. And I have tried to encourage people from day one Please see the opportunity in this time. Please see the good in this time. Please look at what has happened that never would have happened. We have had a shot in the arm for prayer meeting that we weren't going to get without COVID. Praise the Lord. 
I have had opportunity upon opportunity to share Jesus Christ with people that I normally wouldn't get a chance to talk to about Jesus. Praise the Lord. We've had more time as families. Many have had the time to stop and take a deep breath, even if it was just for a part of this time, to take a deep breath where usually we don't get to. Uh, there have been good things in it. Uh, we've, we've had to learn some things. We've had to focus on what matters the most. We've had to do things that are outside our comfort zone, and here we are still doing them. I feel so bad for you in those masks. I'm so glad I don't have to wear one here. I can't tell you. Just walking to the office and back was enough for me. I can't stand the crazy things. Um, I'm never so happy to get back in my truck and say, ah, uh, and I know that you feel the same. But as we look at this, we need to see where Scripture comes to bear. And 1 Thessalonians is one of those books in general that really does. Not so much in our morning study as we look at this chapter together, but it, it does very much talk about the end times and our part in it, and it explains it. And uh, we'll look at that in, uh, with some thoroughness as time goes. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll dig in. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you that we can be together. Thank you for the beauty of the day and the beauty that surrounds us this time of year. We thank you for your word, and we pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to it, open our minds to it. Father, that we will see it, that we will understand it, and more than either of those, dear Lord, that we would live it. And uh, we pray earnestly that you would open our hearts to what you have, in Jesus' name, amen. I tried to make it my, my policy is to have kind of a rolling introduction when I do book studies. The teacher in me likes to drop anchor, and I could, I could give two or three lessons in the background of a book. Most people don't have the patience for that, so we're going to have a little bit of background here, and then there'll be a little bit more that weaves in uh, as the study goes on. Uh, Thessalonica is in northern Macedonian on the Aegean Sea. Uh, it was founded in 315 BC. It became the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia. So Roman domination has a lot to do with what made um, uh, Thessalonica what it was. It was the second largest city in the area behind only Philippi. Uh, Philippi was about 100 miles away. It was an important seaport town, like Corinth and Ephesus, uh, commerce. Uh, the Ignatian Way was a large Roman military highway. Uh, it was made to transport Caesar's troops across the empire, but it was also used for trade. Uh, good roads are made and good roads are used, and it made a big difference in our country to have good roads, and in our case to have high, you know, uh, railroads and eventually highways. Uh, but in their day, roads mattered just as much. And so this was a major stop on the Ignatian Way. This was a major port city on the Aegean Sea. There was a large Jewish, Jewish synagogue there. <clears throat> I want you to understand, Paul had just been in Philippi. Philippi stands out because there was this young lady with a big mouth. And she walked behind Paul and Silas telling the truth, but obnoxiously. These men are servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. These men are servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. Well, you see, this young lady was filled with an evil spirit. She was indwelt by an evil spirit. That evil spirit allowed her to know with no uncertainty that these were servants of the Most High God. But it also allowed her to predict the future. And you can imagine, you know, down on Wall Street and at the stock exchange or at the um, commodities exchange in Chicago, if you had somebody who knew what the market was going to do tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, Oh, the money you could save, oh, the money you could make. And so these men, there were two men, presumably, that owned her, and they were making money by her ability, because of the demon inside of her, to, with some accuracy, depict the future and make people money. And so finally, after being harassed and harangued by this young lady following them, these men are servants of the Most High God, listen to them, Paul and Silas turned to her, and Paul said, I command you, Spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to come out of this young lady. And the Spirit left her. And she came back into her right mind, and she was quiet, but she didn't tell the future anymore. Her owners had lost their golden goose. They had lost their, their meal ticket, and so they were furious. And they got Paul and Silas thrown into jail. They didn't just get thrown into jail. They were beaten and thrown into jail. They weren't just thrown into jail. They were beaten, thrown in jail. They were put in the innermost jail, and they were locked in stocks, hand and foot, in the innermost hypermax that Philippi had in their local jail. Paul was a Roman citizen. All he had to do was say that, and he would have had a trial before his peers, just like you and I are promised. So much of our legal system comes from Roman legal system, from, from their day, and the right to face your accusers, the right to a jury trial, and so forth. That's where that came from. That's where that started. 
But Paul didn't claim it. And because of that, he spent the night in jail. And even in the pain of being locked in stocks, they were praying and singing God's praises and having a worship service in the middle of the jail. The jailer had seen nothing like it. The Lord sent an earthquake in the middle of the night. The chains fell off. The doors fell open. I would have ran as fast as I could and never looked back. Paul stayed there. And knowing that, perceiving, and I think, in the spirit that the, the jailhouse guard was going to fall on his sword and kill himself because he was responsible for these men, he said, we're all here. Don't harm yourself. And the man fell, came in, fell on his face, and said to, to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? To which he answered, Acts 16, 16, 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so the gospel, in its simplest nutshell, in Acts 16, 31, came from that horrible night in prison that Paul delighted in and prayed and gave God glory. By the way, Paul claimed his citizenship in the morning when the town father said, hey, we heard what happened. Let those men go quietly, would you? And Paul said, oh, no. They threw a Roman citizen in here without a trial, without facing his accusers. They need to come in person and see me out the door. And he did that only so he had a chance to preach to them and share the gospel with the town leaders as well. So it's with that in his backdrop that Paul travels to Thessalonica. He travels 100 miles, which is probably about five or six days walking for them back then. He skips several other cities and towns and doesn't plant churches there. He was selective. He planted churches in towns that were very, very strategic, whether by overland road, roads, the Ignatian Way, or because they were a large seaport, the Aegean Sea. So this is why he chose Thessalonica. Um, it still exists today. It's called Salonica. They shortened the name, and uh, it's still there, beautiful city, and it's about three times the size that it was in Paul's day. Uh, Paul knew this church. He founded it. It was his first stop. Uh, Acts 17 tells us the story about it. And uh, what Acts 17 tells us, and um, let's go there together. Uh-oh. It's going to take me a second to get there. Um, Acts 17, Paul has traveled from Philippi. He's come to Thessalonica. As he's come to Thessalonica, he goes into the Jewish synagogue because there was one. That's where he always started. And uh, as a visiting rabbi, he was asked to speak, and so he did. And so he explained to them about Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, there was quite a response to him at first. But the Jewish leaders got jealous. And because the Jewish leaders got jealous, I may not open this because I've already told you the story. Um, because the Jewish leaders got jealous, they moved out and they went to the house of Jason. And... Um, I could be all set. Um, now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, again, they skipped certain towns. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. According to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. In attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. And so this is really something that happens often for Paul. He's well received in the Jewish commu community. A lot of these people we would have called Old Testament saints, you understand. They're living to please God, same as their forefathers had. But among them, there are a number of people that don't care about it. They're just going through the motions. They were born into this. It wasn't that it's really theirs or that they believe it or that they're following the Lord. And so, and still, there are the Pharisees who command all the attention and proudly uh, want people to, to go ooh and ah at their strict religious observance. And so Paul comes in and he gets all the attention and people are, are coming to Christ. And the Pharisees get upset, and so they get a mob. They get them to say untrue things. 
uh, here, this, we're not told exactly what the pledge was that Jason and the others gave. Probably that they weren't going to be insurrectionists, that they weren't going to try to overthrow the Roman government. Uh, the city authorities, town to town, were more, uh, more concerned with that than with Judaism. That didn't matter to them, uh, these secular authorities. Um, the record of Acts 17 says he was only there three weeks in the, in the synagogue, and it makes it sound like the whole trip was a short one. Uh, there is some things that point to a more lengthy stay, at least a few months. Uh, the Gentile response would have taken more than just three weeks, I think, for the Gentiles outside of the Old Testament, uh, outside of um, the knowledge of, of Father, Son, and, or of, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, probably the best way to say it would have taken a little more than three weeks. And he also, he mentions in chapter two of Thessalonians, verse nine, he mentions, mentions his tent making, his side business. Let me tell you, he was not gonna start a business and bring it to a close in three weeks. He wasn't gonna get his name out there, advertise and establish himself, have a period of time to make tents for people and deliver all those orders all in three weeks time. Just isn't the way the world works. Uh, so I think it's very clear that he was there more than those three weeks, but it was still a relatively brief stay uh, that had him there. Let's talk about the book itself, some things that make it distinctive. Every chapter refers to the second coming at least once, most of them far more than that. So this is an end times book. It talks about the return of Jesus Christ that's front and center. And again, chapter 4, verse 17 is the absolute classic. Uh, the, verses 13 through 17, I read it at every funeral I ever preside over. Uh, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, and interestingly, the doctrine of the end times was one of the first doctrines taught to new converts. It's interesting, Paul, we're talking about Paul coming to Jewish people and explaining where Jesus fits in the Old Testament prophecies and leading Jewish people to Christ. And as soon as he does that, he starts to talk to them about the next dispensation about the end times, about the rapture, and especially about the coming day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. It's one of the first things they were taught. Uh, there's an emphasis on the deity and lordship of Christ. Old Testament Judaism, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It was monotheistic, and so there was no, in there, it was monotheistic, monotheistic and unitarian in the sense that it wasn't trinitarian. Don't confuse that with modern Unitarianism. There is no uh, comparison to be made. But we understand, and it took the church a while to, to concretely to call some councils and put it in writing. Uh, we understand that there is one God existing in three persons, Father and Son and Spirit. We call it the Godhead or the Trinity. They didn't understand that. And so for Paul to these Jewish folks, it had to be a particular point of emphasis Jesus is God of very God. The Apostle John tells us in his second epistle, if somebody comes to you with another uh, gospel, don't let them in, neither bid them God speed. So when a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness comes to my door, my first question for them, we get right to it. Is Jesus God of very God? And then this part absolutely seals it. Equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit, because they don't think the Holy Spirit's God either. No, he isn't. Well, then we have nothing to talk about. And the Bible says, I can't even wish them Godspeed. In other words, I can't wish, wish them a good day. They're going around telling people a false religion. They're going around telling people they could be right with God. In fact, they're leading them to hell. I don't want them to have a good day. I don't want to help them on their way. I don't want to wish them well. That's hard for me. Uh, I wish Randy was here this morning. Randy Bennett and I, we got comparing notes. My, home, my true hometown in Indiana and his are about an hour apart. Uh, but uh, we good Hoosier folk, we, we're, we're hospitable people. And it's not natural for us to tell people to get off our porch and not invite them in and be sweet to them. But the Bible says if they come with another gospel, don't, don't bring them in and don't bid them Godspeed. Because if you bid them Godspeed, you're a partaker in their evil deeds. So the lordship and deity of Christ was front and center. Some observations about chapter 1. There are three men listed as the authors. The second one, by the way, Silvanus is the Roman version of the Greek word Silas. And so this is the same Silas that was with Paul on a second missionary journey when he planted this church. So Paul and Silas and Timothy, they're all referred to as the authors. And it's interesting, and I didn't catch it this morning when I decided last minute to put, just put my um, uh, 
word processing file up here, I have underlined all the plural first person pronouns, the we's, the us's, and so forth. He, our gospel, uh, it's all through the chapter. Uh, he's very consistent. It's the three of them writing. The first Thessalonians might have been the first book that Paul ever wrote, the first epistle that, that became part of the canon of scripture. And it's very interesting. I would say to you that they knew Silas very well and that they knew Timothy very well. Timothy was the junior man on that second missionary journey as Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica with the gospel. But Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to help establish the church. And so the church knew Silas and Timothy very well, and the three of them wrote together, which is kind of unique. And I'll be honest, I've taught, as a teacher, I've taught through this book many times, and I never caught that before. That they're all three given, you know, in other places. We, we just read in Romans two weeks ago, the man who wrote the letter said he greeted them. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter. Paul has a penman often. He, he needs the help with his writing. But this is unique that the three of them give, are given equal credit for the writing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. He's consistent uh, throughout. Uh, he wished them grace and peace. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Wishing them grace is a Greek greeting. And wishing them peace is a Hebrew greeting. Shalom. Shalom. Uh, that's still in Jewish circles today. Uh, people wish each other peace. Shalom Aleichem. Uh, it's right there. And so this kind of mixes together Greek world and Hebrew world uh, as one. Grace and, preach, and, and peace. He gives a glowing reflection upon these people. Verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you. We always thank God for you when we think of you. And we thank him for all of you. He doesn't say, I, I think well of most of you. He says all of you. That's pretty neat. Uh, and he, again, he's going to talk about three things about them. Uh, their work of faith, labor of love, and their steadfast hope in Christ. Uh, but uh, he thinks well of them. Uh, and um, he glows. There is nothing negative said. And sometimes we talk about it where Paul will he'll give a positive, and then he'll follow that positive with the admonition, the shame on you. Uh, that doesn't jump out at you here, especially not in this chapter. Um, he reflected well upon his ministry alongside Silas and Timothy, but only in the context of praising the Thessalonian believers for being faithful right alongside them. Uh, he says to them uh, down here when we get down to it, um, verse 5, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. He says, you, you were right with us. You were serving the Lord. You were growing in the Lord, too. Um, he's really praising them, uh, not himself. He's reflecting on how they came to them. Um, he gives thanks for them always. He prayed for them specifically. Have you prayed for one another while you've been apart? If you haven't, may I strongly suggest it? Uh, take your church directory. Whether you're looking at the pictures and those smiling faces, or whether you're looking through the list in the back, pray the directory. Make a habit of it. Uh, I have a pastor friend who suggested this to me years ago, and I've done it a few times. You'd mess it all up today because a lot of you aren't in your pews. Uh, but um, I have a pastor friend who lives next door to his church and he will go in the mornings and if he sits down he's tired like most of us if he sits down and closes his eyes to pray he often dozes and so rather than do that he walks while he prays uh, my uncle one year shot 56 woodchucks while he was praying I, I think that's cheating but um, my buddy will walk around his church in the middle of the week in the mornings and he'll zigzag and he'll serpentine back and forth through the pews and when he comes to a certain brother or sister's spot, he prays for them. When he comes to a family spot, he prays for that family. Because you're all predictable Baptist people, and we pretty much know where you're going to be. Uh, and so pray for one another. Paul prayed for them, and he did it always. He thought well of them. Their work of faith, their labor of love, the steadfastness of hope that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the presence of our God and Father. You see, we believe once for all, Jesus died for me and rose again. We believe and we are saved once for all, but we are to continue to believe that and to make that belief our practice. And so here, their work of faith, their labor of love, their steadfast hope go together. 
Their steadfast hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for them and rose again. And it's in the presence of God the Father. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And so they kept right in it, believing in Christ and the presence of God. He rejoiced in their election. Look at verse 4 with me. Knowing, brethren, beloved of God, his choice of you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, all of it is about election, especially verses 3 through 5. Elect in him before the foundation of the world. Uh, Paul delighted in it. We talked last week about how we see the crisis that we're in and how we see the world that we're in. And, and frankly, we reminded ourselves that no matter what we do about mass and no matter if we stink like Clorox wipes like this, pu this pulpit does, and I have regrets, I'll admit it, um, no matter what we do, we cannot keep ourselves in a bubble. We cannot live apart from disease of any kind, apart from virus of any kind. If God wills that we're going to get the thing, we're going to get the thing. If God wills that we're not going to get the thing, we're not going to get the thing. That's sovereignty. That's God orchestrating in his world and with his people. That is not fatalism. Fatalism does not have a personal God that loves us and has power that we can trust. To me, a sovereign God is a place that I find security and rest. And this is what he's talking about here. We, he delighted that God had chosen them to the faith. He talked about the evident fruits. In uh, our Thursday nights, uh, in prayer meeting, we've been looking at the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount and uh, found a lot of encouragement from it. In uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16, it talks about the false teachers that come in as wolves wearing sheep's clothing. And he says, you will know them by their fruits. What comes on the outside demonstrates what's on the inside. And so Paul here rejoices about their evident fruits. Mark chapter 4, the story of the, um, the four soils, the sower and the seed. Uh, the first soil, the, the seed falls on rocky ground, the bird snatches it up, it never germinates. The second soil looks like it germinates, but it really never had a root, and so it was never true salvation. The third soil, well, it germinates and it drops down roots, but the problem is that fertile ground lets the thorns, the thistles, and the weeds in, and it chokes it off so that it never really does anything. I think... Soil number three is a saved person that never grows. It's a carnal Christian. And soil number four, we know it's soil number four because it brings forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And so by the fruit will be known, Matthew 7, by our fruits will prove our salvation to ourselves and others in Mark chapter 4. Uh, here he talks about it. And he says to, uh, in verses 5 and 6, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul says elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be imitators of me even as I am of Christ. Follow me while I follow Christ. Um, I've had time lately to reflect on some of the blessings God's given me. So much of that has to do with people I've met and people who've taught me. And I have a long list of people who have in some way or shape or form taught me and mentored me. Uh, one of those was Miss Joyce McNamee. She was the head of the Christian school department at my alma mater. And uh, it was fun because she always treated us like little kids. And she told us, and she's right, I found it as teaching high school boys that were bigger than me, half of them at least. Um, kids still like stickers even when they're big kids. And she would give us stickers every once in a while with a smiley face just to prove her point. When we graduated, graduates, you know what she gave us for graduation? She gave us a regular skinny number two lead pencil in varied colors with little gold letters on it with her favorite saying that she used to say to us, be someone impressive to imitate. You're going to go out and teach another generation. Be the kind of person that they can model and be right with God. Be someone impressive to imitate. Paul says it. Follow me while I follow Christ. Let me tell you, those are scary words to say. We want the bumper sticker that says, don't follow me, I'm lost. What we really need to say is, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's what Paul does here. Uh, their salvation story was marked by both persecution and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the joy of the Holy Spirit is most fully seen in the midst of persecution. We really know what he is to us and what he's made of and what he can be when we go through the hardest of times. 
And they found that out. They became a good example to their whole region of Macedonia. They proclaimed the word of God by their testimony wherever their story was told. Their testimony. Uh, verse 7. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues all of us. I su supplied a word or two there from the wrath to come. They were a good example. They proclaimed the word by their testimony that everybody knew about it. They had left behind their idolatry. What was then? They have changed their life radically to serve the living and true God. They lived as those that were looking forward to the imminent return of Christ. And the same Jesus who had rescued them from the wrath to come became their focus and became their delight. So let's talk about our purpose very quickly as we wrap up this morning. We need to be encouraged in what God has already done for us. Jesus, the Son of God, has died in our place. He's paid for our sin, and He's secured our home in heaven by faith in Him. We need to be encouraged by what He will soon do for us. The day is coming when to heaven we go. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. What a day that will be. And this book is about that delight. And that's part of why we're here together in these coming weeks. We're also here to be challenged to godly living. And as we've seen today, part of that is by Paul's admonitions, which he is going to give as the book progresses, but also by the testimony of the Thessalonian church. They left their idols behind to serve the living and true God. Now that's easy for us to picture in their world, right? Their idols were formed of stone. They were corporeal, touchable. They, they, they were things that could be seen and, and touched. Our idols aren't usually like that, are they? Our idols are sin nature. Our idols looking up to people and things that we ought not. Our idols are sinful habits. Our idols are not innately sinful habits that become so big and overpower our Christian life and become by that sinful habits. The day in my life where a basketball outranked a ba uh, Bible in my house, and that never should have been. God let me fall on my face and dislocate my arm to say, Hey, Heyman, put the ball away. That's not what I have for your future. Austin's looking at me. He says, Pastor, you're so short, you should have known that by that man. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, it's easy to make things an idol and keep them there. And what a testimony if we can turn from our idols to living and true God. You, don't, you and I, we think of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a physical, tangible idol as a funny thing, right? Uh, we were talking, uh, I've been reflecting on my days as a kid in California and shared a story last week with you uh, about a young man named Michael. I'll tell you another one, a friend of mine, Patrick Lee. His mom was from Tahiti, his dad was from China. They worshiped Buddha at their house, and his mom, Therese, was coming to our church and had a lot of questions about Jesus. Patrick and I were the same age, got along great, went to his house all the time. We were not allowed to play in the dining room because the dining room had the shrine to Buddha. And that was their world. And I remember thinking, that is so silly. My granddad has something that looks almost exactly like that, and he puts his teeth in it overnight. Uh, that's what it looked like to me. But you know, we see these idols that, you know, how, how you know, even Aaron and the golden calf, to worship something you made instead of worshiping, worshiping him who made you, to us is a ridiculous thing. But in their life, it happened. And among God's people, around that golden calf, it happened. And for you and I, it just happens in different ways. And we worship different things in people and situations. And we need to be very, very cognizant of it, careful of it, and put it behind us. And the bottom line of all of this, and to be honest, the, the preachable nugget, if you will, of this whole passage is this. What are we known for? He said, this is what the Thessalonian believers are known for. They left their idols for the living and true God. They have worked through persecution 
They, they have stood up in the face of persecution and they've stern, stood firm for Christ and they've made him known and they've lived in such a way as not to get in the way of their message. I don't have the time to tell you the story again, uh, but there, there were three Wendy's that worked at the Wendy's that I worked at and one of them I got to share Christ with and she shook her head and walked away from me laughing. That was because my testimony was so lousy that my witness had no salt left in it at all. And it changed my life, to be honest with you. It has a lot to do with me going to ministry. Because on that day I thought, you know what? I can't play around with this worldly thing anymore because it's in the way of doing what God wants me to do. What are we known for? Father, thank you for your word. Please, Lord, that it would bear fruit in our hearts, that it would challenge us, that it would mold and shape us. Lord, that it would encourage us. Uh, Lord, with what you have in store for us and that would encourage us to live for you, we pray in Christ's name. All right, let's stand together as we sing. Will he find us watching? When Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be noon or night, faithful to him will he find us watching with our lamps all trimmed and bright. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? If at the dawn of the early morning he shall call us one by one. When to the Lord we restore our talents, will he answer you well done? Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, Waiting when the Lord shall come. Have we been true to the trust he left us? Do our best. If in our hearts there is not condemns us, we shall have a glorious rest. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother? Ready for the soul's bright home. Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come. Blessed are those whom the Lord finds watching, in his glory they shall share. If he shall come at the dawn or midnight, Will he find us watching there? Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? Bob Boynton, would you close the prayer, brother? I don't know.